two, one. Hey. What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. We have a very special episode today. It's our first time talking about quantum computing on the show. I am super excited to have Dr. William Zhang joining us. Thanks. Thank you for coming on appreciate the show, it. Will. Yeah. Greatly appreciate it. Great to be here. And your background's awesome, physics at Yale and then at Oxford for computer science for a PhD. And now on to Rigetti, quantum mm -hmm. computing, three and a half years now. Yeah, it yeah. goes by quickly, but there's a lot to do. How did you even yeah. like pick you know, physics and computer science and quantum computing? How did you, you know, figure out that that's what you cared about? So I'm, uh, I got into it pretty early, uh, which is like not that common for people to find something they're that into and stick with. I definitely have fought with it at different parts of my career, but I read about it, I think in, like there was a Scientific American article back when I was 14 or 15. Um, and it was about how, uh, you know, you could prove that a certain kind of computer could be better than this, than any computer that we could build. And that's if you made a quantum computer. And as we can yeah. talk a lot more about what that means. But really, um, what attracted me to it was that there's this synthesis of two things in quantum computing that's, that's very rare. And that's the chance to work on something that's very fundamental and is about, you know, the fundamental things of physics and how does that relate to information. And, and I really hope we talk about this a lot more. Yeah. Uh, but then also build technology that could help people. And it's pretty rare to work on a synthesis of those two things. Yeah. And so I, I kind of like stumbled upon that when I was a teenager and then had been kind of like trying to find my way into the field ever since. And I yeah, met some great mentors and ended up in it and have been able to work in it for pretty much my whole adult life now. Oh uh, man, you got hooked in when you were young. Yeah, into that's the key. To, yeah, <laughs> yeah, into wanting to be at that fundamental layer of physics and understanding reality and then, then making that applicable to something that we do every day in so many ways, computation yeah. and processing. Okay, so, I mean, there's so much to talk about. You're a quantum computing scientist, so that, you know, there's so much to do with this. There's, you know, the art, there's the design and the architecture of, of the actual super computing um, processors. There's the, um, there's everything that you're doing with regards to the software side of things on the cloud as well. There's so much that goes into this, the cryogenic side of it. I mean, where do you... Where We've been finding out how much there is, like over time, right? Yeah. You know, you set out and we were a very small team and then we've just kind of learned about how, how much is actually gonna need to go into building these systems for the first time. Yeah, and, and so you were very early, like three, four, third or fourth. In the, it's definitely in the first group. In the first group really in the cool. company, you're up to like 120 people now, um, like 40 PhDs just going hard at trying to figure this out. and. So, you know, I think something that's really important to, you know, I'm really grateful that you brought this. <laughs> um, so we can call this uh, a, a super computing. Superconducting pro processor. Superconducting yeah. processor. It's not superconducting right now. If it it's was, you would be, <laughs> you'd be very cold, <laughs> <It'd> be cold. <laughs> touching it. Yeah, yeah, that would be rough, but. Um, so, okay, so, uh, so now a superconducting processor we are, we are not using electricity, or are we using electricity? You are. You're using electromagnetic waves in the way that we build it. There's a bunch yes. of, there's actually a whole field of superconducting electronics. Yes. But the kind we use is to make quantum computers to amplify the quantum effects of things that are happening. Yes. And so we are using electromagnetic fields and, and signals. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so ver the, the classical style, and we'll be, we'll be short on this, and then we'll spend a lot of our time um, talking more about how this helps us move forward as humanity. But, yeah. the, but the very general idea, rather than having a, a transistor for a zero or a one or an on or an off, there is that, and that can only be in a binary on or off state. This enables a superpositioning of the is it a, it's a photon? Yeah, a so in our case, it's a, it's a microwave photon. So microwave it's photon. It's whether or not you have or don't have a microwave photon is sort of the zero and one. And because it's a quantum mechanical state, you can get these mixtures that are called superpositions. Yep. And then if you have multiple ones of them, you can cause correlations between them called entanglement. And yes, these things, yes. plus some other details, can be used for doing new kinds of computation. Okay, so the microwave photon can be in a state, and this is an eight qubit. The one you're holding is one that we, uh, the team made last year. Last so. year, so this is eight qubits, so there's eight microwave photons that can either be in a state of a zero or a one um, at the same time. 
There's, yeah, there's usually, uh, we always end up having more photons kind of around, but yeah. the, the computational bits are these eight microwave resonators, and it's the occupation of photons in those resonators that we actually use for the computation. Gotcha. Okay. If we could get rid of all the other photons, that would sometimes be really useful, yeah, but they end yeah. up, they're still floating around on it. Okay, and then, the, and then this enables a significant increase in processing. Yeah. Yes. Well, not this size, but... If we scale it up and continue to yes. improve the performance, then that's the trajectory we want to be on. Yes, so like 128 qubits is what you're roadmapped for. Yeah. And so we talked about that recently. Yeah. So one of the like big, so this is a, this is a chip, which is, seems kind of similar at first glance to other kinds of chips that you have for computing. Um, and, but it's not. It's ac it actually is very, very different the way it behaves. Um, the, Fundamental thing, the things that you mentioned, superposition, entanglement, there's other, there's other kinds of things that you get in, in quantum computing. Um, previously, people thought they could only access these features for computation by working with systems that were already very quantum mechanical. There's maybe one way to think about it. Yeah. You know, they started to try and work with ions or electron states or like very small particles and to try and make them behave like computers. And then over the last 15 years, there's been this other approach, which is that you can actually build chips like the one that you're holding, um, and this approach is called superconducting qubits, uh, that are relatively big, but still behave like these quantum mechanical particles. And so the last 15 years has seen um, a bunch of really fantastic academic work, uh, places like Yale or UC Santa Barbara, and, and now many, many other, other groups yeah. to, to kind of bring this field of superconducting qubits to the fore so that we can use these chips to make the world's first real quantum computers. And, and yes. us at, at Rigetti and IBM and Google are, are actually all using this kind of chip-based approach. Yeah. So um, th that, that's one of the big shifts that's been really important in the field in the last, let's say, five years or so. Yeah, okay. And we have some, let's pull up some of the images that we have um, to show this in a little bit um, more of its larger scale um, detail as well. Um, Actually, if you, pull, if you pull up the totem, then maybe we can... Let's do it. Let's yeah, pull up the totem. I can totem show you a little bit about okay. what kind of goes into a full quantum computing yeah, system. Yeah, let's do that. So this is a fun, <laughs> fun little graphic. We've had, actually, you know, <laughs> as someone who's a scientist and like in an academic background, it's been really fun being in a company and working with people who are like professional communicators and visual communicators. This is um, really good. <laughs> yeah. And it's a fun little thing. So what we've got here is the like stack of computing. Um, yeah. we, I mean, it, on our team, you know, this guy D David Bryan has really taken on this challenge of trying to help describe this abstract thing of quantum computing in little graphics and yeah. in different ways. So, we're, we're, so that's hard. one of the things we're working on. Yeah. But so at the bottom, we've got a chip, and this is kind of the graphic for that. And, and that's, that's like what you're holding here. Where this goes. Yeah. Okay. And so the our fabrication team in in Fremont actually makes these. We have we built the world's first superconducting quantum processor fabrication plant um, in, in in the world. Um, with venture money, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it, it wasn't easy, um, yeah. but just like a really great, great team down there um, builds these chips, and then they get hooked up into refrigerators. I mean, you just call them refrigerators, refrigerators. but they're, they're fancy. I mean, they go all the way down to 10 millikelvin. And, and how much colder is that than, you know, zero Celsius? Uh, well, a lot. <laughs> so it's, yeah. it's 10 thousandth of a degree above absolute zero. So, so it's just above absolute zero. Yeah, so wow. absolute zero is where all the molecules are and all the atoms are, aren't moving at all. Aren't, like, that means there's move. no kinetic energy. Mm -hmm. They're frozen. So there's just a little bit of motion. And that, any, that kind of noise and that kind of motion causes errors in quantum computation. It's one of the reasons we don't see quantum effects at scale normally. So quantum mechanics applies to everything. We, we've known about this for you know, 100 years or so now. But if things are, are hot and they interact with lots of things, yeah, yeah. then the quantum mechanical features all sort of, I mean, you can sort of think of it as averaging out to being classical, to being Newtonian physics, to being the stuff you learn about in high school. So you lose the power. So it, we have to keep these things cold in order, in order yes. to make sure that none of this, it's really all about information leaking and, and yeah. interaction. So if you keep things isolated and controlled, then you get these quantum mechanical benefits. And so that's kind of this mm. layer. Like we're, uh -huh. we build these cryogenic systems, and we'll show a picture later, that it cools them down and controls them. and we. Uh, have a team that's um, building control systems for these and calibrates them and all this stuff. And then it, it actually, at the end of the day, it, it builds up into a cloud platform. Yep. So we, we've had these, these are still prototype processors, so they're not faster than regular computers yet or, or faster than supercomputers yet. Um, but very early on, we wanted to make them accessible so that folks could start to practice and learn a little bit about quantum computing. It's a very different programming model um, and try to help figure out how to best use these processors as, as soon as they can. 
And so when we talk about Rigetti, we, we, we talk about ourselves um, sometimes as a full stack quantum computing platform. Give us an idea of the size of the totem. In, uh, is this like about the size of my forearm? Oh, the size of the refrigerator, you mean? Yeah, of the, the, of the, yeah, of, of the um, everything here. Oh, no, so yes, so if we, I think we have a picture of the, one yes. of the dilution refrigerators, if you go to the tower. Um, these things are uh, kind of about, <laughs> about this much in, in diameter, and they're maybe like a okay. meter and a half tall. That's about this. this big. Yeah, so wow. that's kind of like this chair, and about this chip chair. will go into the bottom here. Yeah. Um, and then we'll cool the whole thing down, and you'll, you'll control it. Um, so in this case, the here is your cryogenic system right here? Uh, well, it's even more than this. It's this so this is kind of the guts of the refrigerator. This is the guts of the refrigerator. They're, they're called dilution refrigerators, but uh, it's still a fridge. Yeah. Uh, and then there's all this other supporting system around it that actually does the cooling. Okay. So this isn't even the whole thing. Wow. Wow. And, and, if, and if you come to Berkeley, uh, we've got a kind of array of these in, in kind of the first, Whoa. we kind of call it like a proto-quantum data center which is not like a series of things that I thought I would be like in graduate school. This is the thing, like it's, it's gone so much, it's gone really quickly in some ways. Like when I was in grad school, um, programming a quantum computer was something you did by like writing mathematical symbols down or writing papers. Like I never, like in my, I did a PhD in quantum algorithms and I never really, like I coded in math, I did some proofs. <laughs> like and I never actually had a programming language to work with. And today, you know, we've got students, grad students, w who can sign up with, get an API key and program quantum computers. Like, it's a real thing. Damn. So it's, it's like happening, that. it's happening pretty fast. Um, I'm sometimes like a little bit, a little bit jealous. Um, but one of the most rewarding things about both that things becoming more accessible, and then also, I sort of talked a little bit about how all the things we do at Rigetti, for me has been all those people that you get to be around. Yeah. Right? Like you, like I get to learn from, experts in the world in, you know, the guys we've hired in from, from Intel or other like fantastic chip manufacturing companies to work on superconducting quantum processes for the first time, right? And, and that attracts people who want to do really new things. Yeah. And it's in, in all fields, right? So I, I've, I've been lucky enough to work on different parts. I've like worked on different like, software to calibrate the chips or to program it. Yeah. Um, but kind of just enough to know, like just to do some of the prototyping, to know that like when we need to bring in the professionals. <laughs> at each one of those layers. Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of what we're, what we're starting to do um, at each of the layers in, in the stack. And that's, yep. kind of, that's kind of how, we, how we've grown a little bit. We, we can talk more about that. Yeah. It's been fun. Damn, just even thinking about it compartmental, slightly compartmentalized like that and how you need pro absolute cutting edge professionals in the fields to be able to put this together. Um, okay, you started talking about the programming language. I think this is very interesting. What does quantum computing programming teach us about normal ways of programming? Yeah. Yeah. There, uh, this is a hot button topic for me, so I, I, I can talk a lot about this. <laughs> um, I think the first thing to realize is that because you're changing computation at such a fundamental level, it's not just about bits anymore. And it's not about Boolean logic anymore, actually. It's not, it's not about AND and OR and XOR and these like fundamental things you learn in, in computing. Whoa. It's a different model. So it, when you think about programming, um, typically you think about these, some of these big paradigms that get invented, right? Distributed programming, functional programming, object-oriented programming. Um, quantum programming is kind of like a whole other branch. Yeah. So it's not just a different language. Um, it's really a different branch of computing. Um, which is, if you're kind of a computer scientist like me and you're fascinated by what it means to do computing and, and that sort of thing, then this, this is really cool to, to work with. And teach us about how it's different like that. It's a whole new branch. Yeah. Wow. Okay, let's hear about it. And, it, and so at the bottom, so one of the major flavors uh, or sort of things that you have to deal with to get your head around quantum programming is that it, they're linear algebra machines. So they work with big matrices and big vectors and uh, in some ways, we can write on the coattails of how many people have been learning linear algebra and programming to do machine learning. Because <laughs> um, they've sort of, to do ML today, you, you also need to work with the, kind of these same kind of mathematical tools. Yeah. Um, and so there's so, a lot of similarities. So there's, some, there's a lot of mathematical similarities there. Quantum computing and ML, lots of similarities. Because of the matrices. And, exactly. Like these, yeah. you're working with big vector spaces. Yeah. Um, now, we're hopeful that that will mean that we can use quantum computers to do machine learning. Yes, but yes. That, and there's some super cool papers that have come out recently um, about this topic, but it's pretty uh, geminal, I guess. Like we're, we're, we're starting to figure out how these things might in practice actually work together. But I wanna, I wanna get back to the, to the difference in the programming style. So 
Um, I mean, just some, some basic practical things, you know, that doesn't, just because the programming models are very different, doesn't mean that it's not something that you can uh, pick up quickly, right? So uh, one of the first things we did at Rigetti is um, I worked with a, a couple colleagues on uh, defining an instruction set architecture for quantum programming um, called Quilt. Yeah. Uh, which is a, it's a, an opinionated quantum instruction language. So it's kind of like an assembly level uh, definition for how a quantum computer should work. We weren't ready to think of a programming language, and I don't even know if we are yet now. Um, but the opinion it has is that these quantum chips will work in concert with classical processors in a particular yes. way. And so yes. the instruction set targets these two. It's, it's called a shared memory model. Mm -hmm. um, and so it gets the quantum processor working <coughs> with regular processors in a way that takes advantage of both. And, and we can talk more about that. Yeah. But I mean, one, one of the other cool things about working on that is another example of something I mentioned to you earlier. The first author on the kind of quilt spec and paper and one of the, like my main collaborators on it is uh, my colleague Robert Smith, who hadn't done any quantum mechanics, really. I'd say he'd done a little bit recreationally until he joined Rigetti. And he just had, he, was a, he had a great background in, in mathematical physics and mathematical programming. And he brought this, this different view. You know, if you talk to someone who is a quantum information person like me, they don't think about instruction sets. You know, they think yeah. about I mean, all these like physics things about quantum information and wave functions and stuff. And, and he, he, he helped bring that lens in. And, and so I had some ideas about, OK, hybrid and this. And, and he had this mathematical side. And so Ooh. we were able to make this instruction set. And we've seen that kind of stuff happen over and over again in different areas as we bring in experts to, yeah. to work on quantum. I, I hope love that. Makes that. A little bit of sense. It does, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, it, it it oozes with the importance of multidisciplinary thinking. Yeah. And okay, so now t tell us about Quill because this is very interesting. You want to be able to connect that that shared memory between a quantum computer and a normal processing computer that we have in our houses already. Mm -hmm. So that way you can offset some of the processing, the major processing for all these different uses that we're gonna go over in a little bit. Um, yeah. So the big, the big shift on the hardware side um, was that we could make chips that behaved like quantum systems. So that meant we could scale up the hardware, and that's a big thing that happened in the last five years. On the software side, there's also been a big shift, and that shift is to go away from thinking about quantum computers as something that's gonna be a standalone machine and towards these more integrated systems where quantum computers work with regular computers. The reason for this shift is that um, before we have big and perfect quantum computers, we're going to have small and noisy ones like this. Yeah. Um, so ones that still have some errors. You know, their qubits are maybe a little unreliable. They perform a little differently than how you calibrated them and stuff like this. So to deal with that, you need to compensate by adding in classical resources. Um, or, well, one of the ways to do this is to add in classical resources and to do things like um, Instead of just running one quantum program, you run a parameterized quantum program that you optimize with the classical processor in some kind of iterative loop. So you kind of, one way to maybe think about that is that it's like your machine learning what the quantum program should be. Um, or you, you kind of take a long quantum computation and you, and you find a way to break it into small quantum computations that you can assemble an answer um, from. And these algorithms are sometimes called hybrid algorithms. And, and to support them, you need to have an integrated quantum classical system. Um, and uh, that, that's pretty. That's what we've been building. Like that's that's kind of been the focus at at Rigetti since the beginning. It's okay. We're going to have these processors like in, in these fridges, and how do we make a platform on top of them that people can actually use? Um, and over the last, I guess we had our first processors come up in uh, kind of the second half of the last year, and since then we've seen people from, I guess, 30 or 40 countries running on the platform. They've run more than. Uh, nine, like more than 60 million quantum programs. Um, and so like you think maybe, okay, yeah, this is only something that a few people are gonna think about, but the potential is so huge that folks wanna practice and, and the way to learn programming is to iterate. Like I, I, yeah. was, I learned programming by hacking, <laughs> most people do. Yeah. And so now we have a quantum computer that you can hack on and that, <laughs> that's actually yeah. really helpful to learn how to do stuff with it. And then they, when they get signed up, they get signed up to use your quantum computational abilities through the internet. They're not getting a physical quantum computer at their right. doorstep. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Which, it, which is good because the yeah. physical quantum computers are still pretty expensive. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. they're also kind of complicated to operate. So, so, so we I keep those in Berkeley. Just via yeah. So just via the web, I'm I'm leasing time on your quantum computers. It's that's the good. setup. Yeah. Yeah. And it's another example of something that's moved fast. I think in one of the first dinner conversations I had with, uh, with Chad Rigetti, who's the founder of Rigetti Computing and, and, and our CEO, um, I think one of the first things we really bonded on is he said, I, I want to build a quantum computer and put it online for free. Yeah. And this was in uh, late 2014 yeah. when we were talking about this. And it took, it took a little bit, but, but we did that first. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and it wasn't even actually just us. IBM also did it. Yes. Um, and I think we've, we've kind of realized that a way to help this field grow is to be kind of transparent about how, how things are developing. Yeah. and to try and make it accessible for folks to, to use. And so I, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very excited that that's, that's one way the industry has, has gone. And the, like the code is open yeah. source, and it's in Python, and like all this yep. kind of stuff is, is pretty exciting. So open source code in Python, there is uh, leasing time on the quantum computers, this open, transparent sort of community trying to uh, run these more complicated processing intensive calculations on your time, on your lease, on your quantum right. computer. So let's talk about what this means for the future of, of that. Now, you know, there's so many people that are running these really intense simulations or figuring out how to optimize uh, IT security in general. Um, yeah, t take us down this path. Yeah, so we're not, um, we're not running like big production workloads yet. We want to get there, but there's there's these. Uh, we're kind of in that prototype proof of concept phase for how to use these early quantum processors. And here, there's this sort of three major. Um, actually, this kind of like if we look at what our users are doing and what the community is doing, there's yes. this kind of four major That's buckets. Yeah. Um, one of them is in. Actually, I'm going to start with is simulation problems. So they're trying to simulate how a physical system behaves using another physical system, our chip. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of things in quantum mechanics are hard to compute. So sometimes computing ground state energies or chemical properties or binding energies and stuff like this are, are difficult to do on a regular supercomputer. And one of the reasons they're difficult is that quantum mechanics has all these correlations and subtle details that require very large vector spaces to model. And that's exactly what these things have too. So it's kind of the, the thing that makes these simulation problems difficult is what gives quantum computers their power. And so some of the first uses for uh, quantum computing, and so what we see a lot of people running, are, are small simulations. Um, things like how is, how is some catalyst going to behave? And, and, you, yeah, and you, yeah. you, might, you might think that this is something that only a few folks will care about, that like a few scientists will care about. But actually, a lot of it, like catalysis is a, a big part of some huge yeah. industrial scale processes. One of the ones that is, is good to talk about is nitrogen fixation, which sounds obscure, but uh, it's used to make, it's part of the process for making fertilizer. I was going to talk, biotech probably loves using this. Well, it will. Yeah, <laughs> that, that, yeah. We have to see, but like we, yeah. we, we talk to folks in, in, in biotech. And, um, and so in, to make fertilizer, you take nitrogen out of the atmosphere and you turn it into ammonia using a process called the Haber-Bosch process, which was invented in the early 1900s um, kind of by brute force, looking through a bunch of catalysts to do this reaction. Um, turns out uranium works as a catalyst, but they found another one, <laughs> which is not uranium, which is also good, um, which is this iron-based one. And the thing about it is it operates at 400 degrees Celsius and, Celsius and 200 atmospheres of pressure. So to get the, ca uh, the catalytic reaction to happen, you have to throw a bunch of energy at this system. And we make so much fertilizer to feed a growing planet that one to two percent of the world's energy output every year goes to this reaction. Damn. So if you right, Damn. I didn't. I didn't actually know about this yeah. as a as a physicist, and computer scientist, until I started talking to folks. One to two percent of the total global energy, energy budget. Yeah. Goes to making fertilizer for growing food. Well, I don't know. You can use fertilizer yeah. for other stuff. For other Maybe stuff. I wouldn't use it as yeah. like a fragrance. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. And whoa. That's so, good. Yeah. Well, can you? Can't you use fertilizer for making bombs, too? Really, you're gonna just like throw? I mean, so well, you know, I'm just saying, <laughs> fertilizer has many uses. That, okay. It's true. And one other thing we could talk about is like some of the, and we struggle with this, right? Like if you're building a, a, a big technology like quantum computing, it's like, well, how is this going to be used or misused? 
Yeah. And the ethics around it's really important. Yeah, and then it yeah. comes out of physics, and physics lost its naivety around the Manhattan Project. Yeah. Around stuff like this. And yeah. Sure, and the bombs. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. That's yeah. what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ethics. Who's going to teach ethics. robots ethics? Yeah. yeah. Keep going, guys. Yeah. Good yeah. luck. <laughs> Who's going to teach humans? They're all doing the work of the devil. Yeah. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> We got to have more than hope. We have to have a plan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, so continue on the fertilizer, and then we'll. So continue. if well, just to kind of sum that up, yeah. we know that there are better ways of doing this reaction because there's bacteria that do it at ambient temperature and pressure much more efficiently. We just don't know how they work. And one of the hopes is that we can use a quantum computer to simulate the system and design a better catalyst. And if you make a 10% better catalyst, then you've like decreased our yeah. energy bill for the planet pretty That's well. Huge. Yeah, yeah. And there's other kinds of. Uh, things like this would be useful. Like, it, why are plants so much better at photosynthesis than anything we've built? Yeah, and yeah. There may be some quantum effects in the electron transport chain. Mm -hmm. um, this is all. There's, there's a lot of stuff to to kind of look at and study on that simulation side. Yes, yes. So, so efficiencies are huge. Trying to figure those out across how nature has been so efficient and try and replicate that in biomimic it. Yeah. yeah. And I, th I go even farther, like, it, it, like it's one thing to, so nature guides us a little bit, but we, we should also be able to do better than nature in some ways. I mean, yeah. I think oh, if yeah. We, if we get this thing. We're working. not waiting for genetics anymore. Did you just say yeah. do better than nature? Yeah, yeah. So my favorite <laughs> example of that is the, like, so the second area, major area that people are doing stuff in is, uh, is in machine learning. Um, again, very like early stage. They're training like little classifiers to classify three and five in MNIST, not even the whole MNIST data set yet, but it's, it's early. And so, like, the, the, if I like preempt the question that I get a lot is like, so do, do, do you think our brains are quantum mechanical, um, and do you think that you know quantum computers are going to help us make AGI because we can we can do biomimicry? And what's your answer to that? I don't think so. <laughs> so I, my answer is I well, to, well, I just clarify which bit. I don't. I think it's very unlikely that our our brains are quantum mechanical. They're uh, wet and hot, so they yeah. they have all this like averaging out behaviors that happen. There's been a couple interesting papers uh, where folks look at, okay, if we were to try and find something... The neuron's not firing until it actually fires, this, and there's no superposition. Yeah, as far as we can tell. I mean, yeah, it, yeah. And it would be weird for it to have a superposition, too, because it's, it's very hot. Like, it's at, very, it's at room temperature, right? So for us to take something like this, and, and it's big, like a neuron, and to make it behave so it has superposition, it has to be at 10 millikelvin. Yeah. And we're nowhere near that. We're not, yeah, yeah. Okay, interesting. But there's some, there's some, there's still some cool papers if we try and figure out like what could maybe be a quantum mechanical effect in the brain, which is an interesting yeah, yeah. question. That is an interesting question. There was a paper. Okay. There were a few people who thought that maybe. So I guess um, pigeons have some navigational ability to detect the Earth's magnetic field yeah, with yeah. some molecule in their eye, and that's probably like a quantum effect. So, Ooh. so maybe evolution. It would be weird if no evolution True. took advantage yeah. of quantum mechanics. Yeah. So how can we mimic that, make it even better, and put right. it in ourselves? Yeah, yeah. So you know, it's not whether it's not is our brain quantum mechanical. It's what if we built a brain that was. It was, yeah, yeah. Right, and that's an, that's I think a much more interesting question. Building a brain that is quantum mechanical is that is very AGI esque. It seems. So what was the what's the answer to the second question? Which part? The, the about uh, AGI and quantum mechanics. We don't know yet. I think I think that it, it, that's pretty much the stage of the question. I think what what if we built a brain that was yeah. and, and like there's not really a huge body of evidence to to reply back. Yes. Yeah. Um, we're we're looking at. But so that seems to be it. If I if you have a 128 or 256 qubits, we're starting to approach a level of processing that is just amazing. Well, I think it's amazing, but I don't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say like out of the box. It's gonna be age, like it wouldn't be. It's AGI gonna be out of the box. It's yeah, no, no way. <laughs> just, you open it and it's, it's, it's another toolkit to, to put page. into the to the toolbox, right? And then we're seeing, yeah. you know, we're seeing specialized processors for machine learning, like these TP, TPUs or other kinds of things. Um, we're just talking about sheer amount of data that can be input and then uh, processed, and that's what's really just gonna enable. Uh, you run like we, we should also talk about all these different uses that you know you're talking about the f the kind of the main uses that it's being used for right now for you guys right but the f the future of what this is going to be used for is incredibly important um, it's not going to be AGI out of the box but there's uh, being able to run these bigger simulations being able to quantum communication and quantum encryption these things are these are major parts of our future yeah, if you think on a long time frame, I think it'd be surprising to see them not be. Um, 
it's, I mean, just to, maybe I should finish the other four. Yes. So ML, optimization, and then the, la the fourth big category, uh, and this kind of leads into what I want to say about how it would be weird for it not to be, uh, yeah. is games. Games. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and I the Simulations and games are in very well, many. Well, yeah, like kind of, right? Yeah. Like, but it's also like you get these weird mechanics. Like, you, like you, you get, everyone wants to play with a new game mechanic to make their game stand out a little bit. And if you get yeah. quantum mechanical effects in there, then you can like make superpositions and it's <sighs> kind of fun. It's a quantum battleship game that uh, there's, a, what? So there's a guy named James Wooten who used to be at the University of Basel and he's now, he's now working at IBM um, who built kind of this, like a series of games. Battleships. Yeah, they're really fun. See, I swear it was on F4, dude. I know it was there. <laughs> It was actually it was and it wasn't. I know, it wasn't. Like he, I gotta stop. He's, we should have better. Like, Did you say schedule. James Wooten? Yeah, his name is James Wooten. Yeah, he owes me money. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> quantum gambling, man. Like you know, so you you can make uh, one of the things you can make with quantum systems are random number generators that, as far as we can tell, are truly random. Right. So they're most of the way random numbers are generated in computers are to use these things called pseudo random number generating algorithms, yep. which are not actually random. It's a deterministic sequence, mm. but the statistics of the numbers you get when we test them look random. Yeah. yeah. But in quantum mechanics, you get stuff that's actually random. Huh. Um, like, does a photon go left or right? As far as we can tell, um, you know, if it's actually, you know, if quantum mechanics is right, then this is truly random. Uh, and yeah. so people can build these random number generators that are kind of quantum mechanically. Uh, well, we believe them to be better random number generators than others. And that is huge for simulations and games and. Well, if it's huge stuff. yet, but like for people who are like casinos who really need to generate random numbers that are yeah. truly random that's and they don't a, want anyone taking advantage of bias, I think. Yeah, like, yeah. I think they actually look at this kind of stuff. Yeah. Oh, or also encryption, like uh, two-factor authentications, all this other kind of stuff. Really, imp num random number generators. But I don't think it's an, it's like very, it's like niche. But the, but the, the key yes, thing, yes. the thing that I wanted to like bring up about that is like, so we have things like games, quantum computers, scientific simulations, other kinds of technologies that are quantum and aren't just computers. Yeah. If you zoom out a little bit, we're not just talking about quantum computers, we're talking about quantum technology quantum in technology. general, yes. right? And so yes. this is like, if we, look at the last you know, 200 years, every time we learn more about how physics works and how nature works, we get uh, not just one technology, but a whole bunch of them. A whole bunch. Right? So yeah. we figured out thermodynamics and mechanics, and we were able to have the industrial revolution. Yeah. Right? With, with steam engines, yeah. looms, lots of things. Then we get Maxwell's equations and electrodynamics, electromagnetics, yeah. and we can build the whole electronics revolution. Yes, yes. And we've learned a bit about quantum mechanics, and it's played a part in how transistors work. So transistors wouldn't work if quantum mechanics wasn't true, but we haven't actually embraced quantum technology in a way that takes advantage of all the really kind of yeah. unintuitive and weird and powerful stuff that goes on in it. And I think that's the long-term bet. Like that, that's what we're going to start to see over the next 50 or 100 years is you're not going to just have electrical engineering departments, mechanical engineering departments. You're going to have quantum Quite engineering departments. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, where there's these different kinds of technologies that take advantage of the stuff that happens in quantum mechanics and, and really, really exploit it. I like how you gave us the, the vision of how the industrial revolution blossomed all these technologies and the electronics revolution. We're just at the very nascent stage of the quantum technology revolution, yeah. and it's about to be in every single facet of our lives. We mean so many different areas of our lives. Not in two years, but like let's yeah, take the 10, it's, it's, 20 years. Yeah, get, well, your sure. show you get to we get to make fifty year. We just talk about the long time. Right? Yeah, right? Yeah, that, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, okay, let's let's unpack some of those that we mentioned earlier in as much detail as you think is important. Um, l let's talk about encrypt quantum encryption and quantum communication um, and what that means. Sure. Yeah. So. Um, there's, there's sort of three, if you look at a taxonomy of quantum technology today, yeah. there are three pillars. Yeah. Quantum computing, um, which we talked about, you know, using uh, computer technology to solve problems we can't solve today. Uh, there's communications, which is uh, making networks which their proof of security is only reliant on the fact that quantum mechanics is accurate. Yeah. Which, which is great. Um, it, like if you look at RSA today, or mo most encryption schemes today, they rely on some conjecture, something that's, not, that's more like, um, often it's believing that factoring is hard. So believing that if I give you yeah. a number, it's hard to find its prime factors. 
and we think that's hard. You know, people, there's a lot of money on the line for people to try and do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we've never proven that it's hard, yeah. right? And there's some reasons to think that it actually may or may not, it might actually not be hard in general to do. Given so someone quantum could, computing. E well, even given a regular computer. Mm, e e yeah. So yeah. We, we've not proven that classical computers can't factor numbers easily. We just don't know how. So there is some chance that even without a quantum computer, somebody figures out how to do it. Mm -hmm. But also what we know is that if you had a quantum computer, then factoring is easy. Um, so if you, the, on the communication side, you, know, you sort of switch to this uh, way of sending information where instead of believing that factoring is hard, you just have to believe that quantum mechanics is accurate. Yeah, yeah. But a you know, big asterisk here is that you know, that's, nobody ever breaks an encryption scheme by breaking the like, fundamental proof. Like, yeah. They break it by like, calling you and telling you they're your bank and making you give them your yeah. details. Like, social engineering and side channel attacks. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> it's, it's, but it's still, it's a, like, it's a very quantum communications, quantum, you can do secret sharing, these things, big commitment. You can build a lot of these really interesting schemes with quantum yeah. networks yeah. Um, that I think will all start to play a role. So the, the third pillar, though, yeah. um, is sensing. Um, sensing, quantum sensing. So you can build sensors that are more accurate than any non-quantum machine. Uh -huh. And like an These are really important for autonomous vehicles and stuff like that. The, 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 it's where you really need accuracy over time. So one of the biggest areas that people in that field like to talk about um, is clocks. So atomic clocks are one of the yeah. first maybe quantum technologies, like pure quantum technologies. Um, Dave Wineland run the, won the Nobel for mm -hmm. sort of some of his work. In yeah, he owes me money too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the thing that I think a lot of people don't realize is how dependent we are on GPS for yeah. uh, telling where we are. Yeah. And if the GPS satellites went down, then you could, you, you could lose your sense of location because you would lose your sense of timing. Um, and so folks that really need to have accurate GPS, if GPS networks go down, um, governments uh, or trading um, platforms may need to have much more accurate timing that's decentralized, right? So they have to have very accurate clocks. So quantum sensors are, and there's other kinds of ways of doing things with sensors, but those are kind of the three big pillars. So it's not just computing. Yeah. Um, if we have a quantum computer, though, it can help us design those other ones. Yeah. So and so a, a encryption goes hand in hand with the communication. Yeah. So encryption goes hand in hand with communication, but decryption goes with the computer. With computer. So if you had, yeah, yeah. I think the thing that the thing that got people first interested in applying quantum computers was that Peter Shor showed in '94 that you could easily factor numbers. So if you had a big and perfect quantum computer, you could break into most crypto systems today. But that's the Thank you, Ron. That's our. <laughs> And that's the, that's yeah. the, the we, danger when you break all encryption. Yeah. <laughs> but so a lot of when we started out was, was what you'd talk to people and they'd be like, oh, you're building a machine to break encryption. Uh, and that's just not, that's not accurate. Um, we're going to have probably 20 years of doing stuff in machine learning optimization and, and simulation before we even try and run anything at that scale. And by then, people will have shifted over. Um, so NIST, for example, has had put out a call asking for post-quantum cryptography. Um, relatively recently, so they're gonna, yeah. they're gonna switch in time, is kind of the hope. N NIST? The National Institute for Standards and Technology of, in the US. Of National Institute for Science and Technology? Standards. I Standards is, and yeah. Technology. You didn't know what that meant? NIST. Everybody knows what Everyone NIST knows means. That. Well, now yeah. I get to like it. <laughs> NIST, NIST owes me money. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> no. so okay, so let's, let's talk about, the, so I think as we, as we kind of wrap up, um, I think something that we haven't talked about too much yet that we definitely wanted to talk about was um, what this means for understanding reality in general because we did, you gave us the good breakdown of industrial revolution, electronics revolution, now quantum technology revolution. Um, and you know what we're digging into regarding quantum mechanics is just giving us a tremendous amount of insight into reality. So like, what does this mean? Yeah, I think, so when I, a big moment for me and um, for a lot of people who are, are physicists who work in this field um, was when you realized that, like, what quantum mechanics is. Um, and like you took that first quantum mechanics course and it like kind of blew your mind a little bit. <laughs> um, it, it says all of these things, it says that a lot of things you took for granted um, were not right. 
<laughs> or at least when you like really look into things, they, the model you have of how reality works is limited. Um, you know, things don't have positions. They can be in multiple places at the same time. They're waves and particles. Yeah. You, negative probabilities are really useful for map for understanding things. Yeah. Like all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, well, not crazy, but uh, unintuitive things. Yeah. Um, yeah. And first of all, I think it's uh, like a very human experience to like face your model of reality coming back at you as like totally wrong and to 10 degrees of precision, which is the kind of precision you get out of quantum mechanics. Like we, we, we've tested quantum mechanics to more precision than re relativity, right? Like we really, this theory is very accurate. Um, and that, that was a really powerful experience in my life, uh, not just because it made me want to study quantum mechanics, but it also made me like a little bit more agnostic about believing that I understand what reality is and like how it works. Because if the difference, so, so 100 years back or 200 years back, um, nobody would have thought that this was possible, right? They'd be like, things obviously have positions. Yes, yes. And that's where something is where it is. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, and that's wrong. So if I phase forward like 200 years from now, what else do I believe is like definitely the way things behave that's completely wrong? Correct. Yeah. And I'm sure there's some stuff. Yeah. And um, I, 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 think it's, I think more people maybe should have that experience. I'm like, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of anti too much dogma I like on that. things. I like how I like how pro humility and pro yeah. uh, we know nothing that you are because that open that keeps us open minded to understand that our current interpretations of reality may be flawed, yeah. and so it's well, it's not we, maybe like I think we like <laughs> I, I'm gonna say we, I, that's basically the only thing I know is that is what that we that, perceive is flawed. Yeah, well, yeah. at least like what I believe is 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 the case is probably not exactly the case. All the time, totally. Right? Yeah. But it doesn't, it doesn't mean everything's meaningless. It's a different thing. It, it, that's but, a totally different thing, yeah. But I think I like uh, that. people it's don't really usually good. believe, like if I, you just tell people this stuff about quantum mechanics, or they, they, they read like the Tao of physics, or they read some uh, physics yeah. book, and, and, and it kind of just has some analogies, it doesn't actually have that kind of impact. And I think if you build technology, if you build yeah. these truths about reality into technology that people use, Okay, today it's experts, but like in 50 years, like maybe it's kids playing kids. quantum games. Yes. And they build up an intuition for reality based on playing games for that intuition. Yeah. Um, That's good. I, I think that would, that would kind of change how we think about physics, it would change how we think about reality. Um, and, and I think one way, to put a, a bit of a finer point on it, one of the big insights about quantum mechanics is that uh, physics is different than we thought. Um, to have a theory of physics is different than we thought. Because quantum mechanics isn't just a theory of physics, it's also a theory of information. Right? And that's why you have a different probability. You actually have to generalize probability theory to talk about uh, quantum mechanics in a better way. And so it really changes the relationship between physics and information, which is kind of a mind-body duality shift um, that's, been, that's starting to happen. And so I, I, I will see. I'm, like, I'll place my bet that whatever comes after quantum mechanics is also going to be a theory of information as well as a new theory of physics. So yeah. we'll, we'll see. And there's this cool work that's going on in that. There are people much smarter than me. But, um. So, okay, the, let's let's wrap on um, kind of the the importance of the geopolitical essence of what's going on as well. Um, this seems to be you know a very one of the biggest aspects of exponential technology that is impacting our world and how do we play fairly and nicely with other countries around the world as this gets developed? Yeah. It's a big question. It's not, and, and I don't think, it's, it's an evolving situation. Um, so the US has uh, invested a lot in quantum technology. Some of the best universities are, are here. Um, but in Europe as well, there's been a lot of investment and Australia and Japan and China. Um, and last fall, I think China announced a $10 billion investment in a new quantum computing center, um, which dwarfs, I think the U.S. has been spending a hundred, two hundred million. $10 billion? Or so. Yeah. How do you say, brother, can you spare a dime in Chinese? <laughs> <laughs> find out. I think I'm getting a theme here from what you're, what you're looking for comment-wise. Well, I, don't shake me for change. The quantum computer doesn't work yet. <laughs> it's, all, it's all in that, man. But th that, that in itself is a funny exchange just because you can tell where um, resources are being allocated by one of the world's you know, 
waking giants and where our resources are being dedicated. So, but it's not. I mean, there was a new there was a new bill on the Hill recently um, that was passed, and it's for it's called the National Quam Initiative Bill. It was passed last week. Um, wow. And it would provide some allocation of funding to start some programs here, um, and you know has to it's going to the Senate. So like I, I'm not a political expert, <laughs> um, but it would be one of one of the things that I'm really excited about with quantum computing is is seeing it develop in the private sector and for private use um, in an open way. I think this is a way to make the technology most useful as soon as possible. Yeah. Um, and, and that's why one of the reasons I'm very excited about, about Rigetti um, and that a lot of us are, are excited about bringing this technology into the hands of, of private businesses who can, who can figure out how to use it for all sorts of, uh, all sorts of stuff. So opening this technology up for more children and youth and just open sourcing it, making it easier for people that want to lease time on quantum computers, just literally plug these totems into their existing computing systems, that this is sort of the future, hopefully, that we can open source and make it easier for people to, to get used to this yeah. Yeah, industry. I mean, our hope is that eventually you have kind of like a quantum AWS, where you have the normal things you can do on cloud computers, but you can accelerate it. In the same way that a GPU is an accelerator for graphics on your desktop, you can think of a quantum processor or quantum computing system as an accelerator for a data center or a supercomputer. Yep. And so if we can get there, then we, we, can, we can hopefully still start to solve some problems that we thought weren't solvable before. Yeah. Okay, um, just on the way out, we like to ask some questions. Uh, you haven't been asking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we like to okay, ask some of our... I thought I got to ask you some. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you get to, we get to switch roles now. Uh, we get, we'd like to ask a couple questions that are um, themed uh, with our show. Uh, the first question is, do you think we're alone in the cosmos? Um, no, I don't think so. Uh, how, how much do you want me to dive into that? Dive into it. I've been reading the free body problem, right? So <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. And Anders Sandberg has hit that recent paper about the, uh, the Fermi paradox, right? Um, I, one of the fun things that I like to wonder about is uh, what would like radically different intelligences look like? Yes. And so to like Good. flow on to this question of um, like what if we built a brain that was quantum mechanical? Like well, what does an intelligence at an, like an astronomical scale look like? What would, if, if you had a, something that was communicating and thought at where there were like light years apart, could, I mean, maybe you couldn't build a system because of the speed of light that could have intelligent thought then, but maybe you could. And what kind of intelligence could, could be lurking underneath quantum physics, right? So we, you know, there's these, I don't want to dive into it, but if you've seen the Ant-Man, there's like quant the quantum realm, right? <laughs> Uh, have you seen Ant-Man? I don't think so. Oh, yeah. uh, you gotta go see it. There's okay, like, okay. It's, it's some friends I know who are quantum physicists who, who consulted a little bit on it. When Ant-Man gets really small, he goes into the quantum realm. Oh. Okay, it's still like okay. science fiction-y, hokey, but there's these uh, fundamental beliefs about certain length scales in, yeah, in quantum yeah. mechanics. So it, like here's, the here's, Planck here's, length? Yeah, like the Planck length. So yeah. uh, one of the things that quantum mechanics and, uh, and its follow-on things tell us is that, that there's no such thing as an empty vacuum. So if you have empty space, huh. then there's actually particles popping in and out of existence Whoa. in this kind of, something they call it, like a foam or something like that. There's no such thing um, as a vacuum. And so like, what's inside there? Like, what's going on? Like, what's happening? Yeah. Um, so I think there's just, there's like all of these huge differences in scale yeah. and all of, like, I would be surprised if only there was evolutionary potential for intelligent life at our scale. Totally. Um, totally. As so in, I don't think as, in, as in uh, intelligence could evolve at smaller scales, larger scales, different senses, all these different variables that are calculated. Because information processing happens at all those levels, yeah. right? And so if you, if you think about intelligence, at least as some kind of information processing, then I would be surprised if it was just had the evolutionary pressure here. Okay, Will, do you think that this is a simulation? Is this based reality? I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna. This, this, I, I don't like. This, I don't on, like this question on, because yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I don't like this question because I don't think it's that well, like, well uh, typed, right? So, like, a simulation which is so good that you can't distinguish it from reality is no longer a simulation. It is reality. Mm. Like there's no like there's no difference between these two terms. Mm. Um, so. I don't think it's a well-formed Okay, so, if, so if you're in a simulation that's so good that it's indistinguishable from a reality, then it becomes a reality? Yeah. How, well, how could it, 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 it? You just said it was indistinguishable. 
Yeah, but, but then it still exists as a simulation of a base that is somewhere. Yeah, so do, what, what's, how would you rephrase the question then? That there's like some base somewhere else? Yeah, a base reality or yeah. a simulation. But there's no difference. You said they're but, indistinguishable. Well, but uh, the, the, <laughs> so the base reality is yeah. the one that simulates the simulations. The simulations, when you're in them, feel like it's a base reality, but it's really not because the base reality is the base reality and the simulation is just the simulation. But the, the question is yeah. about the advancement of incremental advancement of technology, no matter at what rate we advance it, eventually, yeah we in this become, li lots of us live in virtual realities that are indistinguishable. You could be living in one right now in your 80 year mark. Could be. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think the terms are not well defined. Yeah. Like I okay. think I'm gonna, if, I think if we, we could have a longer conversation on it, but I think if we really dove into the terms, which would which, which be worth doing. Yeah. Because then, because you have to it. struggle with it, you've got to like. Make the questions better. Because if you're saying like, yeah, you have to define what it means to be running a simulation, and I think, yeah. I think it's kind of our, we have, there's this human tendency to use the technologies of your day as analogies for things. So when uh, in the Industrial Revolution, yeah. people use analogies for uh, steam engines, for uh, how your mind worked, and for your brain. <laughs> so we still have these phrases around, like blowing off steam. Right. What? Like That's where like that these came kind from? of like yeah. Right. It's it comes. It's it's a metaphor from the industrial revolution. And because they thought that the brain worked like a steam engine, or they made made an analogy out exactly. To it. Yeah. And wow. so now we have neural networks, and so we do the same thing, and and, and we're gonna we're gonna keep doing. It. I'm sure that people are gonna say it's like a quantum computer when yeah, we have quantum computers. Yeah, yeah. But this doesn't mean it is. A it's simulation. Just, a simulation. And so yeah, now yeah. we talk about things as a simulation because we have these simulation technologies. Yeah, yeah. But I think it's just a metaphor that we use to try and grasp it. Um, certain yeah, kinds sure, of things, sure. rather, and, but and so I I want to bring that up because I think some folks take it to like a some kind of like reducto ad absurdum ontological argument about like meaning, which I think is probably not. Maybe it's just me thinking that we know nothing again and that we shouldn't actually. That's a good point. <laughs> That's a good point. Um, posing the question though is uh, it has some sort of ontological just beauty to it. Mm, I think maybe something about the essence of being. Why is a potential that it is a simulation rather than a base reality. And aren't we just going to be simulating our own realities in the future? Last question, Will. Okay, so there's, you go to, so Kant has this idea of transcendental illusion, right? That you should believe something even if it, you can show that it's probably inconsistent because it has other reasons. And that may be, yeah. that may be a reason to argue against simulation. That's a whole other conversation. Yeah, I, I, look, I look forward to <laughs> unpacking this more. Yeah. And, and this was just, you know, quantum computing um, 101. There's you know 102, and there's uh, there's so much more to understand about about what's going on with this technology, uh, and just all these other cool conversations that we'll have. Last question: What do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? <laughs> That's a strong one. Wow, man. So um, I I think I do actually have an answer to this. Um, it's a it's a it's a big art project. Um, it's a very collaborative art project, um, and lots of really really talented artists have worked on it for a really long time. But it remains consistent, even though so many different people contribute to it. Uh, actually, anybody can contribute to it. It's totally accessible. Anyone who sort of learns how it works can can contribute. And it's not even just purely aesthetic as an art project. Parts of it have been applied to do things. To, to help people to make technology, um, and maybe you know what I'm getting at, but it's mathematics viewed as a whole. Yeah, I like that. I like how you called it an art project. I think it is, right? Yeah. It's, I mean, pe people, it's, people talk about um, the internal elegance and consistency of parts of it, and it's, it's got all these amazing features to it that you can view as an, as an, as an, artistic, as an artistic lens. And I think one of the other reasons to think about it that way is that you know, we've kind of learned a little bit more about what mathematics is over the last 150 years, and it's not really a Platonist view anyway. It's not like we're discovering mathematics. It's, we're, we're actually constructing and inventing it, and there's a lot of choices. There's a lot of aesthetic choices that go yeah. into, into, into mathematics. Um, so I, I, think, I think the collaborative art project of, of, of math, math is, is probably the most beautiful thing in the world. <laughs> it's the first time we've heard that answer. That was deep.
That was a good one. Okay. Will, <laughs> what a freaking pleasure cool. this has been. Yeah, yeah. thank That's you for fun. coming out of the show, teaching us about quantum computing and our future with it. Um, yeah, I love after shows like this. It, it just further affirms that I know nothing. I love, I love it. Happy to help. Uh, Happy to I help mean, you with that. We're in the same that. boat. Then, yeah, we're in the same boat. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Um, there's so much to unpack in the future of quantum computing and what it means for society. I'm really excited to continue um, being a part of, of helping out with the dissemination of this technology and the proliferation of it, especially into hands of more, um, of more kids and philosophers, ethicists, computer programmers, all mathematicians, all the different pieces that are really needed. Um, much love, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you guys had a good time, give us a comment below. Let us know your thoughts. What are you building in this industry? What are you talking about in this industry? We'd love to hear from you. Also, go create. After you've learned from this content, go and make cool things. Go make vlogs. Go make videos. Go make companies. Go and execute cool things with this. Also, thank you to Ron, our producer and director. Thank you so much to Will Zhang and Rigetti. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in, and we will see you again soon. Peace.